I'm Chuck DeVita, uh, and I uh, thank the people at CES for inviting me to uh, come have a discussion with you today. I'm not here to give a presentation, I'm here to have a discussion with you. That means that you have to interact. I know as GSB people you won't have any problem doing that. But it helps me as a speaker because I get feedback through your questions and your issues as to whether or not I'm driving the discussion in the right fashion. Does anybody here uh, have as a primary interest getting consumer customers? Okay, we're not going to just talk about that. This is about talk selling and marketing to the enterprise, okay? I can't spell retail, all right? I have no experience in that space. Does anybody care, care a lot about going to the small and medium business SMB market? Good, because I don't know anything about that either. <laughs> okay, um, I started my life as an engineer uh, and then moved into product marketing and then into sales and then sales management and then general management. Along the way, I built two startup companies, one in combined hardware software and the other a software company that were somewhat successful. And then my last real job, which ended in 1995, uh, was at a public company that had been unprofitable for uh, several years, and the vision was that I would fix sales and everything would be wonderful. And indeed, sales needed fixing, but so didn't the rest of the company. Suffice to say that through proper focus, getting back to what we were good at and discarding doing things we weren't very good at, uh, we did return the company to profitability and quadrupled the stock price in the course of two and a half years. Uh, at that point, I had been speaking at some conferences and getting a lot of applause, and so I decided to see if I could turn applause into money and hung my shingle out, initially as a company called Sales Process Systems, which was about helping companies that were at public stage and later improve sales productivity, revenue growth, and revenue predictability through a set of sales management and marketing management methods. <coughs> we actually developed a model we called the Integrated Sales Management Process Model. At that point in time, it was viewed as an oxymoron. Uh, so uh, then some venture capitalists asked me to work with some early stage companies to help them get funded and build their business plans and that kind of thing. And then along came a partner and uh, we brought in a consultant to figure out what to do with our company. We changed the name to Growth Process Systems and uh, we have a range of services from the first stuff that I did to working with companies to help them get funded to uh, an outsourced capability for getting reference customers. The processes for getting reference customers, initial customers, and selling to the enterprise are very, very different from what you want to do once you have a proven solution and you're established in the marketplace. And I'll tell you about that as we go along. So um, the goal I have is to help you uh, have a better understanding of the challenges and best practices for acquiring your initial enterprise customers. And for the argument's sake, let's say we're talking about companies that are $100 million or greater in size. All right. Uh, this is about our company. You have the notes, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. We're a small consulting firm. Uh, I also teach in continuing studies. I'm currently teaching uh, the last of six sessions on a course on selling and marketing software as a service to the enterprise. Um, and I will this summer teach a six-week course on developing value propositions and pricing models. These are courses taught in the evening to people like yourselves who are running companies. And I'll do the SAS class again in the fall. So the, uh, the items I'd like to try to cover today, and I assume we have about an hour and 10 minutes, something like that, Claire? Uh, is uh, what I call moving from vision to execution. We'll talk about, does anybody not know who Jeffrey Moore is or Crossing the Chasm? Everybody has that book, right? If you don't buy it tonight, there'll be a test in the morning. It is one of the Bibles of Silicon Valley, okay? Uh, we have to understand what stage are you at, and I have some methods to help you do that. We'll discuss selling models, uh, various kinds of products and solutions, and then what do you want from customers? a model that we call the value pyramid, which is quite useful for figuring out how to bundle what it is you're doing for your customers. Uh, and uh, then we'll discuss how you enter the market, what about ideal customers, why do you need to have an ideal customer list, and uh, we'll talk a bit about value propositions, and if we get through it all, then positioning and messaging architecture. Uh, so that's kind of what I'd like to cover. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, What's your number one goal this year? Somebody tell me what your goal is for your company. BJ, what's your number one goal? Um, starting up. Huh? Starting up. Starting up, okay. 
Can you, so in your process of starting up, relative to getting customers, what's your number one goal? Is it getting revenue? Yeah. Wrong goal. All right, next. Robert, what's your number one goal? First paying customer. First paying customer. Okay, good. Anyone else? So I would posit that the number, you can only have one number one goal first, okay? And that it has to be achieving reference ability when you're selling to the enterprise market. And we see many companies that make the mistake of I need revenue and I need it fast, so I'll take any customer who can fog a mirror and has some money in their pocket, okay? And what that is is a sales anywhere strategy which usually results in failure. Failure meaning we plateau out at some point in our growth that's unsatisfactory. Our support costs are high, lots of bad things happen. <coughs> so when we have that condition, it's usually because we didn't make the appropriate focus decisions on what not to do. And the decisions what not to do are some of the most important things as you're building a company, particularly as with respect to customer acquisition. I'm often called in by boards or CEOs to do surgery on companies because, gee, sales are stalled out. It must be those salespeople. Figure out what's wrong with them, okay, because that's part of what we do. And uh, in fact, when we take a look, oftentimes it's that the company never turned down a customer. And so they have all kinds of verticals that they're in, all kinds of applications they're supporting. Their support costs as a percentage of revenue are very high, and a lot of bad things happen. Okay, so revenue growth should not be your first goal. I'm suggesting it should be referenceability. This does not mean you don't get money from the customers you acquire early on as references, and I call it serious money, but you're not on a revenue growth plan. And if you're the CEO of a company and you're out looking for investment and you don't yet have your references in line, you haven't learned what to do yet because you don't know what the market wants. You haven't yet turned your silly putty technology into real products and solutions that the market wants. So I encourage you, if you're a CEO of an early stage company out looking for investment, be careful of telling investors what your revenue growth curve is going to like before you go through that phase. And we'll talk more about that, okay? And then the question is, how, how many of you have both goals? Oftentimes CEOs will say, well, we need references, but boy, we need our, ref our re revenue growth right now, right? And that's a confusion and lack of clarity, and it's, uh, it's one of the most difficult early decisions you'll have. So what you want to do is you want to find an intersection between a market opportunity, some product or technology capability, and access to decision makers who have acute pain about the problem that you pose to solve. We call that the sweet spot. So many times we see companies focused over here in Silicon Valley, and maybe they don't find a sweet spot because their baby's so beautiful, all they have to do is show it to the world and everybody will want to buy it. Anybody have that as your business plan for going forward? Okay. Small companies do not have the resources to educate a market. So I'm going to tell you several times today, do not have a strategy of educating the market about how wonderful your product is. Okay. So you've all been through a stage where you had an idea. You then sort of move that into a strategy of how to go forward with that idea. You then explore and focus some ways of attacking it in terms of target markets, product types, company types, and then you go into execution mode. Along the way, some business uh, planning and, and team building events occur. And the good thing is with today's technology, we don't just introduce a product and then have to wait a long period of time for feedback. Typically, we get feedback fairly quickly and we iterate the design as we go forward. And hopefully, revenue and cash flow look something like that. Okay? So, don't design a perfect product early on. Think prototype. Think a minimal feature set to get feedback from the market. And many times I see founders who want to build the perfect product before they ever go to market. This is particularly true for companies that are founded out of Israel with engineering teams from Israel, because Israeli engineers don't care what the customer wants. They know what the customer needs. And I've seen that in several cases, all right? And sometimes there's success and sometimes not. So your product will evolve over time. That will result in different value propositions and pricing models as you go along. So I encourage you to think, if you've thought of a very sophisticated capability early on, dumb it down. Make it easy for people to understand. 
How many of you are in technology of some sort or another? A fair number of you. What we tend to do in technology is we tend to tell complex stories with Word documents that are thick and people don't understand. Investors don't understand. So one of your biggest challenges is achieving clarity and simplicity. And if you can do that graphically rather than in words, you'll be better off. And I'll show you some examples as we go forward. So this is Jeffrey Moore, okay? I assume you're all familiar with that. And uh, over here, you have the risk takers, the experimenters, the people that I call we do death by demo with, right? We keep showing the product and we do demos, we educate, we do more <laughs> demos, we educate. And the issue is they don't have all the money. The people with all the money are here in the early majority and the late majority, the people with the big budgets. These people, as you probably know, don't buy on your feature set. They buy on a banker's mindset of what's the return on investment and can they accept the risk of dealing with you as an early stage company. The reason large corporations won't do business with you is much more about your, their perception of your risk of survival as opposed to your technology. So one of the things we need to do is try to reduce that perceived risk in the customer's mind. Okay, um, so who sells what in this model? Well, early on, it should be the founding team and you're trying to get one enterprise customer and you're really discovering sort of some basic needs. You're going in and you're saying, how do you do it now? And what are the issues around how you do it now? What are the problems? And what if we could do X and Y and Z? Would that matter to you? Do you have enough pain about this problem that you'll work with an early stage company? And will you give me access to your staff? Because that's a lot of what you want. And oh, by the way, I want you to give me a bunch of money. And there's no product. We are not selling a product at this stage. We are selling a vision at this stage, okay? And one of the things I see is people think they have to finish the product before they can deal with customers. Robert. Okay, so you may have a product, but are you, are you saying you're going to alleviate their pain for the money that you're giving? Absolutely, okay. yes. And they're gonna participate with you with the development and they get some privileges out of that. So they get early access, they get to influence the feature set, you might give them some kind of access for some period of time before you go get other customers in their space. Be careful of long-term exclusives. Those can be really dangerous. Exclusive only hurts you when you're successful. When you're not, they don't matter. So be very, very careful about having exclusives. Robert. So just to be backstage, I'm at, my question is, on the cold call, what do I pitch to them about why they should open up and why they should talk to me? Well, first off, selling is not about pitching. Selling is about listening at this stage. Okay, selling to enterprises is much more about consultative approaches than it is about pitching a product. So don't pitch, all right? You need to find out, do they have acute pain about the problem that you're solving? If the answer is yes, would they like to learn more about what stage you're at and your vision? And now you have a, sec a meeting with them and you tell them where you're at and you explain that you need some help in taking this to market and they're an op they have an opportunity to be one of the early customers to help you. And what you want is staff time, and you want them to become a reference, and you want money, right? And by the way, on becoming a reference, I'll talk later about reference types, but um, with an early stage deal, you don't want to write into the contract, permission, I get permission to go talk to their PR department. PR departments are in the business of protect, preventing you from saying what you want to say about your relationship with a large enterprise. And so what you want to do is write into the contract the statement that you want to have, all right? And so the issue is, this is a filtering model. We're filtering for acute pain because quite a few of the prospects will not agree to the set of conditions that I'm laying out. So the next stage is the learning stage. And here we're trying to get typically around five enterprise customers where it's an executive team, we have a set of services that we provide as an outsourced sales organization. You're combining technology and services, typically, a little bit customized for each customer, so that after you have five in a marketplace, you've learned what the market wants, all right? And you're learning about the product development process. Now then, you go to a professional sales team, a standardized product and solution, it's very transaction oriented, and you're looking at tens and hundreds of customers to be acquired. All right, and the question I raise for you is where are you 
in this spectrum, and I'll show you some ways of measuring that. And the other thing that is really interesting is we see a lot of companies who are over here hire the professional sales person or team and marketing person or team from the large company in the related space here and they put them down into this situation. Six to nine months later, they're gone. They quit or get fired. They're very frustrated that they don't have standard products and solutions because that's what they're about, is doing transactions. And the CEO thinks everything's ready and we should be on a revenue growth path when you're not. And I hear from a number of founding CEOs who say, oh, everything's ready, we just need orders. And then we go in and we do an assessment and we find out that everything isn't really ready. I'm not talking about the product, I'm talking about value propositions, I'm talking about positioning, I'm talking about pricing models, all right, uh, support capabilities, all those kinds of things. Because the product development typically in technology is about 30% of the challenge of going to market. All the other stuff is to 70%, and the costly part, okay? So avoid hiring that execution-oriented team or executive when you're down here. So down here, you're not generating demand. You are using a filtering model to find out if they meet your criteria, and we'll show you some more about that. Here, you are generating demand. It's a very expensive game, all right? Sales and marketing as a percentage of revenue here typically is gonna run somewhere between 35 and 60% of revenue. That's right, 35 to 60% of revenue. Big, big number. It's one of the reasons you need investment, okay? And you can look at all the successful companies and they're in that range when they're down in here. Here, we don't have that kind of money to spend, so we're very selective. Think about it this way. Think about the next six to nine months. How many enterprise customers can you bring into your company and, and support properly? It's a limited set, two, three, four, five, some small number. Why shouldn't you be selective in terms of who you give the privilege to of being your customer? Interesting concept. Well, how do you do that? You have a list of the characteristics that you want, an ideal customer criteria list that we'll talk about more, all right? And you're very selective as to who you agree to let be your customer, okay? How are we doing so far? Does it make sense? All right, uh, have you seen all this stuff before? Okay, all right, so this is okay. All right, going ahead. Uh, so the challenge is filtering, not educating. You don't have the resources and the bandwidth to educate the market. All right, uh, you're familiar with the, the sales learning curve by Leslie and Holloway, I assume, all right, that they did in 2006. That's a very good paper on uh, this particular area. So I told you I was gonna help you understand what stage you are at, and this is a set of charts we've developed so depending upon your funding, you might be in discovery and learning or execution. With regard to marketing, are your value propositions non-existent? Uh, value hallucination, as Steve Blank says, by the way, that's a very good book, Four Steps to the Epiphany by Steve Blank. If you haven't read that, a very good read. Steve is a very successful entrepreneur, uh, did, started eight companies, four wildly successful, and he has lectured here. He also uh, is a professor at Haas, and, um, he and I have done a number of events together, so it's a real good uh, book, The Four Steps to the Epiphany. Um, pipeline, is our pipeline non-existent? Have we started to develop it, or is it fully developed? And you can see, I don't need to go over each one, um, but it, the, this one on partners, you know, channel partners raises an interesting issue. How many of you think your initial market approach is gonna be through channel partners? Good, because channel partners do not establish your references? Uh, somebody that resells your product, okay? In some fashion, th through a variety of kinds of relationships. They, they're in the business of taking your product, once you have proven you can get customers to make money with it, and now participating with you in some fashion by providing some of the set of services of going to the market. But they are not effective, typically, at helping you establish your uh, references. Product development, all right? What's the, uh, what stage is it yet? Prototype, prototype, alpha, beta, or production? Is there a product roadmap? All right, is it preliminary? Is it more detailed and functional? So you can see as you start to look at these components, you can measure where you are with regard to sales. Who is doing the selling? <coughs> All right, is there a sales process? Do we have a sales process model that is proven or not? How many customers do we have? Do we have a worldwide perspective in what we're doing? How many of you 
are going to go worldwide in the first year of your operation. I would suggest you consider doing that. When I built my companies, I was traveling internationally within the first year. Uh, and I think it's pretty important today, especially when the barriers for purchasing around the world have gone to zero through the internet. Okay? Uh, and then with regard to services, which are really, really important, uh, who's doing them? Are they productized or not? Right? And are they provided by yourselves or by system integrators? That's another issue for you to think about. System integrators early on are not very effective for providing your services. And the other thing is, when you're getting your first customers, why would you want to give the success of your customer to somebody else? You want to control that success. So while system integrators may have a role to play in your future once you're a proven solution, uh, you must be careful about trying to use them early on. Robert. Oh, that's my firm, Growth Process Group. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not trying to give an ad for that. But <laughs> yeah, good, good pickup. Okay, so what do you want from your early customers? You want their time. You want them to look at your specs. You want them to look at, uh, test your prototypes. You want meetings with them, all right? You want their help, right? That's, that's a group of people. <laughs> So it's really important if you're going to an enterprise deal such as the type I'm saying, which is a development partner customer relationship, that the person who makes the decision to work with you has the political power to allocate resources, right? Because if they don't have the political power to allocate resources, you aren't going to get the time of the staff, right? And as I said, you want to get very clear on what kind of reference they're going to become. Now, you do want money. And, and here, my suggestion is, let's assume three years from now, your deal size, for argument's sake, is $100,000 or $200,000. You ought to get at least half now, all right? Not $10,000, not $5,000, okay? And um, that brings up an interesting point. What's the definition of a customer? My definition includes must have given us money. So those of you who have free trials of one sort or another, those aren't customers. Those are free trials. They may have value for you, but they do not have the level of commitment that a customer has, okay? Um, so without the money, you won't get the commitment of the staff. Because imagine for a minute that Jenny comes in to see me and she pitches a particular solution I'm interested in and she gets significant money from me and Thomas comes in and says, I'll let you have this for free at this stage. Where do I assign my team? where I allocated the money, right? So the purpose of the money is to get the access to the resources of the enterprise customer to help you develop the product. Okay, what do you want from later customers? Well, it is about revenue, sorry, clearly. It is about if, if you have a land and expand model, growing from departmental to enterprise-wide use, right? You want to upsell and cross-sell. And if you're in a subscription kind of business, it is about getting renewals. In the, in the software space, which I work a lot in, uh, now it's software as a service is the name of the game. And if you don't have renewal rates that are well above 90%, you will have unsatisfactory financial results. Right? And so what that means, for example, in that particular segment, is you must have a very high value placed on customer delight. Go ahead, Lauren. Yes, that means you sell other modules or other components that you could have sold, all right? You sell them other stuff. Yes, DJ. Ah, <laughs> I think I have something on that. Ask me that question. Ask that question again if we go through it and it's not here. Uh, and uh, it, that's an interesting issue. But what technology companies in particular fail to do is understand the value that they provide for the customer. And so what happens is they tend to price their offering low. And many times we see the opportunity to raise price substantially. And good things happen. Tire kickers go away. Access to higher level executives increases. Top level executives don't solve $10,000 problems. They delegate that three levels down. If, you want, if that's what you want, that's fine. They're not bad. Just know that's the level that you're going to deal at. If you're trying to solve an enterprise-wide problem, and I'll show you uh, what that means in a minute, uh, then, then you perhaps need to be at a higher level. 
This chart speaks to the characteristics of uh, enterprise customers that are early adopters, okay, and those who purchase later on. So for example, uh, does the early adopter require that the product or solution be fully defined? No. Do they require vetted value propositions? No. Are their decision makers typically visionary? Yes. Do they typically have good political, high political power in their corporation to take risk? Yes. Right? They're not looking for references. So back to the ideal customer criteria, if you are in a filtering model and you're talking to an executive at a firm you think you want to sell too early on, and they say, well, what do you have as references? That's probably not a good early customer. You put them in the bucket for the majority and you keep them warm through communications over time until you're ready to go after them. They don't expect sales tools developed and so on. And of course, the reverse is true over here, okay? Um, so, this, by the way, has implications for who should be doing the selling. These people that sell over here tend more or less to be talkers, and this is more of a challenge of listening. Robert. Yep. No sales tools at all. Just tactical comments on do you prefer cold calls or email first or brokered contacts is the best. Brokered contacts come from advisors, from uh, people like myself, from potential investors, from professors who may know opportunities. All right now, there's a good and bad side to a brokered contact. It gets you in the door. It does not equal a sale. You must still have a structured sales process to go through to a successful close. And the other thing is that if all you've done is sold through brokered contracts, you haven't yet proven you can go when, the, when you didn't have one of those, when there's a, a, a door that you gotta bust through, okay? Is that answering your question? Yeah. yeah that's the best uh, approach. And you wanna utilize those as much as you can early on. Okay, uh, so uh, how many of you plan to sell in a top-down model where you're going in at a high level? One, I see one hand, okay. Uh, the initial target is the enterprise. You develop the enterprise app. It is classically a, what's called a complex sales model, and there are a variety of uh, methodologies for how you uh, do that kind of selling, you know, Miller, Hyman, uh, total ta target account, task group, uh, solution selling, and the like. You need to qualify early for good fit and stop selling when there's not good fit. One of the things that sales organizations and individuals who are selling at this stage as well do a poor job of is stopping selling when there's a low probability of success. So we, you need to get clear on what early qualification for good fit means, have a list of qualification criteria, and be ruthless about using that, okay? It's essential to get these people to give you time. It may involve trials, but they don't have to be free, necessarily. In fact, what we find with the enterprise solution providers that are my clients is they've typically moved from free trials to trials that are charged for, typically somewhere in the ten dollars to $50,000 kind of level for a solution that might cost $250,000 a year, all right? Why? It's called buyer commitment, all right? And what they find is the conversion rate for the charge trials is 60, 70, 80%. 90%. For the free trials, it's 10, 20, 30%. So substantially different. And yet, we have technology companies and early stage founders who say, well, gee, I'm just unproven. I can't ask for money. You know? The only reason an enterprise will spend time in meetings with you is because they believe that you and your team are the best team to solve the problem that you're going to solve for them. As soon as they don't believe that, the meetings will stop. Because buyers are always making decisions to stop purchasing cycles, right? So equally on your side, you should be evaluating how well they fit and deciding where to spend your resources. Okay, you will have higher selling costs per order with this top-down model, but once you get management commitment, adoption success is given because they have the political power to commit the resources, all right? And so you get faster adoption if you get that top-level commitment. Alternatively, there's a bottom-up model, typically a land and expand kind of model, where you're going in at a departmental level, all right, and you're getting users excited, and 
Uh, initial revenue, in fact, may be advertising or subscription-based. Revenue growth will be slow. Early sales do not establish your referenceability. And the probability of getting the enterprise is low. Um, I have a client in Sausalito that uh, solves the problem of reducing workers' compensation for Fortune 100 companies through a software as a service model. And when I got involved with them a few years ago, uh, their process was to do what I call plant seeds. They had trials everywhere, hoping they would blossom into real deals, right? Real deals being on the order of a quarter million dollars a year. And they were very unsatisfied with the success rate of that, of uh, blossoming into real deals. And so we, uh, I actually became an interim VP there for about nine months, sales and marketing, to restructure the whole process. And what we did was we focused on the value that we're providing for the customer. We started calling higher to get commitment. And then we packaged the trial into the contract such that if we meet the success metrics for the trial, rollout becomes automatic. And we negotiate the contract before the trial. Now that's not an easy thing to do, all right? But none of this is easy, okay? So um, it's not impossible. Now the second target then is you grow to the enterprise level. And the challenge is how do you grow uh, departmental use to enterprise wide use, okay? So the investment for this model typically is higher, okay? Now, I want to talk about three product types which go along with what we've been talking about. There's an enterprise solution that solves an enterprise problem. It changes the way work is done across the enterprise, all right? It, is, it very much must be a top-down model requires a high-level executive decision, who has the political and resource allocation power. That's one of the things you need to learn to measure, is do they have resource allocation power? Do they have the political power to take the risk in their organization? Committees are very common to give input, right? And free trials are typically not productive in this model. And your typical examples would be companies like Oracle and SAP. Now, then there's a departmental solution, which solves a departmental problem changes the workflow in the department, and it is what's called land and expand. We'll get this department working up and successful, and then we'll expand to another group in the company. And my uh, client right now, Technologies, in the CRM space is out of that model, and they're doing about $180 million now and growing quite nicely. And by the way, they're hiring, they're looking for people. So, um, so we secure a beachhead, cross-sell and upsell, typically does require a departmental executive decision who has resource allocation power within their domain, and free trials may or may not be productive for generating sales, and these are some examples. Uh, and then there's a point product, okay? Um, this is a point product. It's a live scribe pen that allows me to take notes, capture audio, and have the notes synced with the audio so that I can share them with people later, all right? Gwabit is an interesting point product. If anybody's not familiar with Grab Gwabit, G-W-A-B-B-I-T, it scrubs the contact information out of your emails and puts it automatically in Outlook, right? So it's sold to individuals who happen to work at enterprises and they have no political or resource allocation power. So don't fool yourself if you're in this category that you're selling an enterprise solution. It does not change the workflow in the enterprise. It is clearly a much more viral kind of model and free trials are typically expected to generate sales and examples would be Salesforce in the early days, Gwabit, LiveScribe, and others. So those are kind of the three categories, and I'd like you to, if, if you're in two categories of the three that I described, you probably have some focus work to do, okay? Um, so, the same questions apply independent of what kind of business you're in when you're selling to the enterprise. What problem are we solving for customers? And when I uh, teach my class on uh, selling and marketing SaaS to the enterprise or to doing value propositions, I ask each person in the first class to get up and tell me what problem they solve for the customer, 15 words or less. 70 to 80% describe the features of their product. It's, it happens every time I do it, okay? So this is not easy to do, to put yourself in the customer's shoes to understand what you're doing for them. And if you can describe it in quantitative terms, as it impacts them financially, it's better. 
All right. Are your value propositions clear and quantified? How often do you go to a website for a company to see what they do and you can't figure it out? Or you do figure it out and then you go visit and the CEO says, oh, the website isn't right. We're, we're doing this. All right. The website's the most important sales tool a company has. And one of the most important functions of a website is the ability for a non-prospect to qualify themselves out without ever talking to any of your people. Somebody who is not a prospect for you, who qualifies themselves out, has high value for you. They don't waste your time. All right? So think about what you're doing in your website in those terms. The initial goal, as I've said, I'm suggesting very strongly, it should be referenceability. Then what do you want from customers at various stages as we march through right, discovery, learning, and execution? And is customer delight central to what you're doing? I had a great experience uh, today in the consumer space, which I know nothing about, with uh, Zappos. Um, I had bought a, a pair of Allen Edmonds shoes, several hundred dollars, and they're the wrong width. So I, I called them up and I said, I want to return them, no problem, we'll send you the label by email. And gee, we don't have the width you want. Would you like us to go to other websites to see who has them? They went out to other websites, found another, and I, and I placed an order for the correct size. Do you think I'm going to go back to Zappos next time I want shoes? You bet. All right? Excellent customer service. Uh, same with Tiffany's. Tiffany's, uh, and, and these experiences I know are consumer, but Tiffany's several years ago, my, daughter, my younger daughter is the senior legal counsel for the Flow TV division of Qualcomm, and she had done some work for me, some legal work on contracts, and didn't want compensation, so I wanted to get her a nice gift. And so I started looking at Tiffany's, and I looked at all the different kinds of things that she might want, and I saw a few, so I called in, I said to somebody on this, they had a glass globe, and I said, can that be inscribed? Gee, I don't know. It's downstairs two, to two floors. I'll go get one, and I'll find out and call you back. Five minutes later, yes, it can be inscribed. So when I need that kind of thing, I'm going to go, I know where I'm going to go, all right, because it's hard to find wonderful customer experience. Amazon, same way, right? What is Amazon great at? Selling books? No, providing excellent customer experience. That's what they're really good at. Okay, are your corporate goals clear and published? How many of you have corporate goals on a page of PowerPoint? Well, develop it, okay? Why is it important? It's really important for communicating with your team as you add team members. It's super important for developing sales compensation once you have salespeople, all right? And we often find there's a disjoint connection or not connection between corporate goals and sales compensation system, and that results in very bad things. Expensive sales, poor close rates, and what I call entering markets through sales accidents, which is dangerous. Okay, how should the sales process evolve? Uh, do you know who to sell to? I think in this deck I'll show you a model of figuring out who to sell to. We have an approach we call the value pain matrix, where we list the problems we could solve, we list the title types who ought to care, and then we evaluate them on a number of factors, like do they have acute pain? Can they create budget? Do they have political power? Right? Are they the owner of the problem? Early on, you do not want to sell across departments. That results in long sales cycles and bad close rates. Who makes the decision to buy? Oftentimes, when you enter into a discussion in an enterprise, you have a sponsor who brings you in, and then somebody else, called the economic buyer, makes the decision to buy. Companies have a practice of preventing sales organizations from getting to the economic buyer, right? They protect them, the cloak. You need to be able to find out who's doing what role. And in this regard, you might look at miller Hyman strategic selling. I think it's called the new strategic selling. You want to understand what are the characteristics of an economic buyer, a sponsor, a coach, a user buyer, and a technical buyer, all right? Most people that you'll deal with have the ability to say no in terms of stopping the process moving forward. The only person who can say yes in and of their own power is the economic buyer. That is not a title. There's no title that's economic buyer. It varies according to the deal. It varies according to the length of your relationship with the company. If in fact you're viewed as mission critical and this is your first deal with this company, all right, the economic buyer is likely to be quite high. On the other hand, if it's your 10th deal to a division of the company, economic buyer is liable to be a purchasing agent, right? So learn to evaluate the people in the buying process through a methodology, and there are several that are commercially available. How long does it take to implement? 
In the old software world, as an example, you know, we bought a million dollars worth of software and four million dollars worth of services and it didn't work for the first year, right? And so people had a lot of bad stories about places like SAP and Oracle and the others. Today, in the software world, through software as a service, you can give a new customer a successful first user usage experience within weeks. And whatever it is you're doing, whether it's in software or technology or not, you want your customer to become successful quite quickly to get enthusiastic about what you're doing. And then what about channels? Does it make sense to use them initially or not? How much will they pay to the question you raised? And uh, we'll, we'll get into that. So, um, okay, we still doing okay? Yeah, all right. This is a model called the value pyramid. I've used this for years uh, in classes and with clients relative to how are we going to position what we sell? How are we going to bundle? our domain expertise in a way that creates maximum value for the customer and maximum price or deal size for us, okay? So down at the bottom here, uh, you're a component, uh, you're a bolt, you're a semiconductor, all right, uh, you're, you're a newspaper, all right? Up at the top, you are a much more extensive uh, solution for an enterprise. Now, uh, the attributes are different. Okay, down here it's price delivery and quality. Market's very large, typically horizontal. Up at the top, deal size is large. Differentiation from competitors is high. And uh, market is smaller, okay, typically. Uh, so I'm not here to tell you where you should be in this model at all. I have no bias in that regard. What I am here to tell you is you cannot be at the bottom and the top. And if you're not where you want to be, you have to get there quickly because of organizational and cultural issues. Well, why is that? Well, down at the bottom, success is the customer's responsibility. Think cell phone. Good out-of-the-box experience, not much in the way of personal support. Go to the website, get some information, download some more software, okay? All right? And so you will get people in your staff who know how to do those things really well. Up at the top, success is much more the supplier's responsibility. Think a set of robust services, all right, that go along with your product to help the customer be successful, to ensure success. Robert. Um, I think I'll show you an example in the next slide, and then because we moved from somewhere in the middle to up with my second startup, okay? In the initial company we built, our deal sizes were millions, and they were very strategic to our customers. So the answer is it is, and we'd have to get into the details, all right? Uh, the devil's in the details. Um, but think about in your, what you're doing for your customers, who owns success of your product? Is it the customers or is it yours? And what do you need to do relative to organizational structure, culture around customer delight, and resources that you need to uh, assemble uh, to do that job well, okay? So I, I, this is the slide I wanted to get to. In my second startup, it was a software uh, tools business, all right? And when I joined, um, it was a, professor from the University of California who would go to a trade show and sell a few. And then we'd go to another trade show and sell a few. And I was VP of everything initially and then ended up being VP of Worldwide Sales. And so initially our, our order size was about 15,000 and we sold a couple licenses and some maintenance <coughs> and some user training, all right? We went through a, uh, a year of no new product capability from engineering, which is a death in that business, all right? And I'd been around the world holding seminars on the product offering that we had at that point. So I sat down with the VP of marketing that we had and the VP of support services and I said, we're gonna have a new product offering because I've gotta do a new set of seminars and I can't go back with the same thing. And engineering's not gonna help. What are we gonna do about that? And we came up with what we call a solution model. We called it our pilot project. And it was a set of stuff. Now we were not turning the company into a services company. We were using services to leverage the product sales, all right? And what was really interesting for me, in addition to all this stuff, was we said, we're gonna help you 
dramatically improve the quality of your design reviews. I had seven vice presidents at Sun each jump out of their chairs and say, I'll buy one. I had vice presidents at places like Xerox and General Dynamics and Hughes Aircraft. Yes, I'll take it. Because we are terrible at design reviews and it's hurting us financially. It's taking us too long to roll our projects out. That was an aha for me, right? About here we had this domain expertise that we could package into a solution for the customer, build the deal size, build the value for the customer, differentiate ourselves from competitors, and uh, it made it easier to work with new companies and new markets because we were partnered for their success. We would come back and do success reviews. Right, that was part of the package. Yes, Robert. The design review only of how your products fit into their overall workflow. No, no, their design review, their design review process. They were not doing the design. In other words, they would do a design review, and then later they'd find an error in the design. Many of them, right? So they they didn't feel like they had a uh, good process for doing that. And and our capability as packaged here dramatically improved that. I just cite that as an example. Each of you have domain expertise that you're giving away for free right now. And you need to start thinking about how you can package it in to your product. You'll productize it eventually, but initially maybe you're not ready to productize it, but it should be packaged in with what you're doing. Companies will do business with you because of the expertise of your team, right? They don't do it because they love your product early on. It's because of the expertise of your team. So package that expertise in a way that maximizes the value in their minds. Remember, we're trying to approach this from a customer perspective. Okay, so this is how customers look at this. When I was a salesman for Fairchild Semiconductor a long time ago, um, I spent time with component engineers at places like Hughes and Xerox and General Dynamics getting my integrated circuits on the approved vendors list. All right, I was operating down here. Right? Up at the top, you're contributing to uh, strategic issues, organizational issues. And again, I'm not saying where you should be, but these are choices you get to make. And some of the choices are what not to do in terms of this. So when I hear from a founder, our product can be sold to consumers, our product can be sold to enterprises, it doesn't matter. It's about the domain expertise that you are going to build about your customer's problem. And you don't have enough resources early on to do it for everybody. When I hear, we're going to have a vertical approach and these are the first four verticals we're going to do. No, you're not. Not successfully. Because when you approach a market vertically, that means that people in sales, marketing, support, and development have domain expertise about the needs of that vertical. There is no way in hell you can put together domain expertise about several verticals in an early stage company. And even larger companies have difficulty doing that. Make sense? Okay. Um, so, let's talk about how we go to market. This is the entrepreneur's dream. I have a product idea, we'll design it, I'll set some goals, I'll hire a bunch of salespeople, and away we go. Anybody been in a company like that? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, here's a better way in, in my view. You do the strategic stuff that we talked about earlier, then you select some candidate target markets, you propose some ideal customer criteria, and as Steve Blank says, you propose value hallucination. This is your view of your value before it's been vetted in the market, okay? And as Steve also says very well, there are no facts inside the building. There are only facts outside the building, so get outside the building, all right? Facts come from customers and prospects. Now then, you select some target companies in those target markets, and you select some target titles that you think should care. This is all kind of done through database research, okay? Hoovers, that kind of stuff. Then we get out in the field and we talk to them. We find out, do, uh, do you have acute pain about the problem I'm solving? Well, if you can't describe the problem you're solving, you're gonna have difficulty with that solution, that discussion, sorry. So that's why we emphasize, don't talk about your features, talk about the problem you're gonna solve for the customer. Do you own the problem? All right, can you create budget? Because budget doesn't exist for this solution. It doesn't exist yet. And do you have the power to allocate resources to work with us? And what you want is yeses for all of those. There may be some other attributes, like if it's process oriented or whatever, okay? Uh, and you use that as your filter. Now, 
We iterate through a number of target titles, through a number of target companies, and a number, hopefully not more than two, target markets. But you might find the first target market doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't great. So they should have a couple of backups that you could go to, right? Um, I was involved with a company in Seattle uh, in the uh, clean tech space. And the problem they were solving was reducing the cost of energy for distributed operations down the power line. It turns out that what you pay for power is a function of the voltage and utilities have to guarantee a minimum voltage at the end of the line. So near customers pay a lot more because they're, and it's a, it's a function of the square of the voltage. And so, um, their, their technology uh, regulates the voltage all along the way. And they were going to go to utilities as the market. And they asked me to come in and help them. And I ended up doing an interim role with them as well. And um, the problem with utilities is what? They're not early adopters, typically. They're becoming so. Maybe PG&E was smart moderate. Meters is, is an example of an early adopter. But, but typically, utilities are very slow to make decisions, right? They're bureaucratic. They're people protecting the way of doing business, all right? And so we changed. The second market we went to was those companies that have distributed operations like 7-Eleven, um, like McDonald's. Um, and so where we could get a central decision in an enterprise, and there were distributed operations who would benefit from this voltage regulation, cost-saving approach. Okay, now, as you do that, as you're out talking to these customers, you're moving from assumptions to facts. You need to be objectively critical of yourselves about what are assumptions. I'll go through conversations with companies and they'll make some statements about some things relative to customers and markets. And I'll say, is that an assumption or is that a fact? And they'll say, oh, that's a fact. And then we go through the next phase of the conversation later on. I say, give me the numbers about those facts. Oh, you want numbers, excuse me. Facts come in numbers form, okay? And so be objectively critical of yourselves about what are facts and what are assumptions. And then you need to notice this. This is a difficult part. Choose a market. What do you mean? I can only sell in one market? Initially, yes. If you're familiar with Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm, it's the beachhead concept, okay? Now then, you acquire your development partner customers who are giving you money but also access to their staff. You're refining your product, you're developing your sales tools, you're refining your value propositions and developing your sales process. I was involved with a company in uh, 1999 actually that was a hosted play then. We didn't know it was called Software as a Service. And the problem we were solving was improving the supply chain, which was external to an enterprise, for the problem of packaging electronic devices like laptops. It turns out that the process of designing and manufacturing a package is quite complex, often involving a hundred parts. And what happens is product development is late. We've announced we're going to introduce it at a, a show, right? And so packaging gets squeezed in terms of the time it can do its job. And therefore, the quality of the packaging declines. That results in an increased rate of damage to the product and returns, financial value. Okay, so we developed a solution for improving the, and, and by the way, most of that package work is done by vendors who are external to the enterprise. So we developed a solution for fixing that problem, better, faster, cheaper with the supply chain. So the first customer I got was Hewlett Packard in Boise, uh, $200,000 a year on a renewable days basis. And I went back to them three months after they had the product and were using it. I said, how are you doing on integrating the supply chain with our solution? Uh, oh, well, we're not going out to the supply chain yet. We love the product. We're using it for internal control this year. We're going to do the supply chain next year. What do you think I said when I went to IBM? You cannot learn these kinds of subtleties with a bunch of smart people like yourself sitting around a table. It doesn't happen, right? You only get that kind of thing relative to value with talking with customers. So one of the important things about developing value propositions is once you've sold something, go back and ask, right? And that's something companies don't do a very good job of. Now then, we're moving from, at this point, from learning to execution phase. Now we hire that expensive execution team in sales, marketing, and support, and we go into a repeatable model, a process-oriented model, where we can say, if we add a resource in sales, marketing, or support, our revenue will go up by X amount in Y period of time. And once we know that, we now have a money machine, right? 
And now we need growth, growth investment to grow it, and the investors will happily dump buckets of cash on you if you can prove that. All right? Now, this is a much lower risk model for entering a market than the previous one. Okay? Failing fast is what's important when you're down here. Learning, capturing that learning in a structured fashion such that you grow and learn new things as you move ahead is what's really important. Okay, so what about freemium? Um, I had the CEO of Inside View in to speak to my class in continuing studies the other night, and he uses a freemium model. And so freemium says you offer a free version, it has limited capabilities, and then customers will upgrade to the better, better product and they'll buy it, okay? And uh, some of you plan on doing that kind of thing? No? Yes. Maybe. Okay. So th that, th here, here's the important thing about it. Uh, it's good for large horizontal markets. It's much more about point products and maybe departmental than it is about enterprise. And uh, it requires a well-baked offering, so you don't want to do this early on because you don't want those first users to say, this stuff sucks, I'm not going back there, right? Uh, in uh, Umberto's case, the CEO of Inside View, he said uh, it was two or three years after they launched before they went to a freemium model, okay? Um, it has to be well-baked, and it is not a free trial, and it is capital intensive. He's already raised uh, $19 million. He didn't say if he was profitable. My strong guess is the answer is no, all right? And that he's going to be doing another round. So it's a capital intensive game. So one of the things, of course, you all look at, I'm sure, is how much capital do you need to get to sustainability, right? Uh, and typically with uh, subscription model kinds of products, what we find in the software space is the investment required is 1.3 to 1.7 times what it was for the on-premise game because the cash comes later. All right, so software as a service is not cheaper. It doesn't require lower investment. And if you have not a software product, but a subscription model where people are paying you over time, you need to take that cash flow into account in, kind of in the investment that you need. Now, this is just some data uh, collected by a group I work with called Soft Letter. If you're in the software space, softletter.com is a very good newsletter. They hold uh, events uh, four times a year called SAS University. I'm a speaker at those and the next one's in Washington, D.C., uh, July 20th. Uh, and they, they hold them different places around the country. But you can get their newsletters for not a lot of money. And what he's saying here is the, the results are that freemium is not that successful for companies trying to sell to the enterprise. I won't go over all the details. You can look at the notes later. Okay? Just one example. There may be others. A question? No? You guys aren't asking me many questions. You're not disagreeing with me either. There's something wrong with this group. Stanford Business School group? You've got to be disagreeing with me. Come on. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about ideal customers, right? How do we describe an ideal customer? Well, they have the problem you solve. They know they have the problem you solve. If you have to convince them that they have the problem you solve, what do you have? A long sell cycle, right? So they have to know they have that problem and they have to have acute pain. Now, how do I measure acute pain? I ask the decision maker, is it number one, two, or three in your budget for this year, solving that problem? If it's not, it's not acute, in my view. You may have a different method, but define a method for measuring acute pain. Define a way of asking about it, such as you can determine if they have that or not. Will they provide early access to the economic buyer or not? As I said, companies are in the business of preventing you from accessing the economic buyer. Now, imagine it's 1998, and you have the best uh, Salesforce automation solution in the world. At that time, it was called SFA. And you're working with the team, the committee, and your people are coming in, and you're doing the evaluation, and it's six, nine months in the sell cycle. Now you meet with the economic buyer, and the economic buyer says, my team loves what you have. And you're getting pretty excited. We're going to get an order. But I have a problem. All of my budget is allocated to Y2K this year and next. Would you like to have known that in the first or second call? Yes, all right, I see you grinning, Robert. That kind of thing happens, trust me, all right? And uh, of course, when it happens, if there's a salesperson involved at, and they do it many times, they aren't gonna be there much longer, okay? If it's just you as the founding team, that's your time that's your critical resource. 
Is there consensus on value versus price? How often do you go into a deal and they're trying to beat you up on price? Right? If you've done a good job of understanding the value and priced it appropriately to map into their payback requirements and they're beating you up on price, go down the street to the person who doesn't do that. All right? Remember, you're only trying to get five customers initially. Or maybe it's three or seven, but it's a small number. Right? So be very selective. Then, of course, there was always the thing of how big are they, what vertical are they in, where are they? We don't want to spend any money on traveling. Uh, I don't think that's the right approach, but we hear that. And are they willing and able to pay? All right? Now, um, these are the attributes that we don't focus up on enough that are really critical. Right? Do they have the problem? Do they have acute pain about what we propose to do? Can we test for that adequately or not? Okay. So have a list on PowerPoint. How no, do you set new for I use, is it number one, two, or three in your annual budget for this year? Solving that problem. That's my approach. You may have another approach. All right. In other words, I'm asking the decision maker, the economic buyer, for this kind of a solution very early. What are your critical issues, your critical success factors you're trying to do with this year? So inherently that a product that is doing something better than they do already would never have a deep pain, right? I don't know the answer to that, but be careful of uh, having nice-to-haves. Mm -hmm. Provide products and solutions that are must-haves. Nice-to-haves don't win if that's all they do. All right? You have to have a must-have. All right? So that's one of the reasons why you want to work with your development partner customers to develop a product offering that is a must-have for their market. Nice-to-haves get lots of meetings and lots of demos and very few orders. Soft value. We call it soft value. Soft value alone does not float the boat. Okay? Um, so I, say, I made this point earlier. How many customers can you take on in the next period of time? It's a limited set, so ration out those valuable slots to customers who meet your criteria. By the way, I said early on, uh, I was going to talk a lot about the importance of simplicity and clarity. Your ideal customer criteria, one page of PowerPoint, no more than 10 bullets, one line per bullet, large font. All right? Getting clear is really, really hard. You must get the complexity out of your thinking, and sometimes it takes outsiders such as your investors, your advisors, your consultants, whatever, to help you do that. Why? Because you're hugging your trees. You're dealing with your daily issues, as you should be. You have difficulty seeing your forest. So, an example. Um, I was working with a company uh, that came out of uh, network support companies, and early stage, and they were gonna, their, their problem they were going to solve was reducing the cost of support for network equipment companies. Okay? And so we were going through sort of an assessment phase, and I said, well, does your software product know all the devices that are on the network? Yeah, we know that. Are they all on maintenance? No, typically not. Does it know which ones are on maintenance and which ones are not? Yes, it knows that automatically. Well, couldn't you propose a value proposition that is about improving revenue for your customers by allowing them to go to their customers if, the, if those, that customer would put all the devices on giving them a deal on a per device basis but raising the maintenance contract, never thought about it. They were, they were hugging their trees and I was looking at their forest, okay? Doesn't mean I'm smarter, I just have a different perspective, that's all. all right, so you need somebody with an outsider's perspective. And the other thing relative to simplicity and clarity, you need to develop a story about what you do that's so simple your mother can understand it. Okay, that's really important. Okay, assuming your mother's not an engineer. Okay, um, so let's talk about value propositions because this is really, really key. My view is it is a concise statement, ideally quantified, about what you do for your customer about improving revenue, reducing cost, or improving control. Doing value proposition work is really, really hard. I have a client in San Francisco right now where the CEO said, I want you to train my product line managers to improve our value propositions, because I looked at the value propositions and they're very complex, and they don't have any quantification. It would have been a much easier job if I had just gone in and done the work for them, training the people to get out of their 
very tactical mindset and raise the level of their thinking to a financial problem is a difficult thing to do. Okay, what do value propositions do? They answer these kind of questions. Is it less risk? Is it faster? Is it cheaper? Is it better? All right. Nothing about features on this list. All right. Will it enhance my career? There's a concept in Millerheim and Strategic Selling called um, wins versus results. All right. Results are the results for the company, the measurable impact. The win is the win for me, the decision maker, in deciding to work with you. All right. You always want to understand the career impact of the decision maker in working with you and your team. And you want to minimize that risk or find people who will take the level of risk that you provide. Okay, so how do we develop value propositions? You've heard me say it before, simplicity is really key. Describe the problem solved from the customer's perspective. One page of PowerPoint, large font. Develop before and after views, day in the life of. What happened before your solution arrived and then after your solution arrived. And graphical is better than text, and I've found that it's extremely hard for insiders to do graphical views of the problem they solve for their customers. Okay? You map value to pain. You craft messages by title or function as derived from your value proposition. How many of you have companies that already have uh, taglines? Okay, do you have clear value propositions? Maybe not, okay? Yeah, and, and that, why? Because taglines are cool, they're fun, right? Uh, moving at the speed of business, whatever your tagline is, okay? But that's not where this, the hard work occurs. It has to occur at the value proposition level. Okay, next page, same thing, we're still developing. We then make assumptions on parameter ranges. What are parameters? Revenue, cost, control, kinds of metrics, all right? Now, this is why I advise people, don't solve problems or try to solve problems you don't know anything about. Why? Because if your assumptions about these things are way off the mark, you won't get the second meeting. Now, what happened in the bubble? The 20, some of you may be in this category, I don't know. So, uh, the 20 somethings from Kansas came over here and they said, that's an interesting market, I don't know anything about it, I'm gonna own it next week, and the VCs funded that, right? And now most of them have gone back to Kansas because those companies generally didn't survive. Okay, you develop preliminary quantification from a TCO perspective. Does anybody not know what TCO is? Total cost of ownership. The, the customer has other costs besides what they pay you. They have to do some training, they may have to put in some infrastructure, or they may have to make some changes. So you have to understand the customer's costs, right? And it's better if you get them to tell you what their costs are rather than you enter, you uh, assuming, but initially because you know something about the problem you're solving, you should have some estimate. And typically, their costs of switching to your solution are non-zero, right? They may be substantial. You then test your preliminary value propositions, and then how do you know you have a good value proposition? Do you come to talk to somebody like me who blesses you and say that's a good value proposition? No, there's only one way, get an order. That's it. So you keep trying to get orders around this value that you're gonna provide, and you modify it as you go along because you're learning fast. And each time you get turned down, that's an opportunity to improve, not an opportunity to get depressed, okay? And now you go back and refine it with real customer data. How am I doing on time? Five, whoops, okay. Uh, so this is about the value of outsiders, but customers verifying. Here I want to talk about the graphical approach to uh, value propositions. So. This is a, the first version of this was a, um, a data warehouse application uh, that uh, an early stage company we put together for sales and marketing executives of large companies. And before our solution rolled in, analysts who are I hired to uh, recommend action to management were spending all their time running around in the silos of information, right? Gathering up the information, organizing it, and taking action this is a generalized chart here. Could be selling, it could be developing, it could be supporting, right? It could be w whatever it is that this particular entity in the enterprise has to do. The after picture with our $300,000 solution, gathering and, and organizing is automatic, enabling the analyst to spend a much bigger portion of their bandwidth taking action, 
in a much faster period of time. This difference in time has huge value for the customer of this system. Who in this room doesn't get that picture? Nobody's going to raise their hand, I understand that. All right? the, it, because of its elegant simplicity. The first version of that took us an awful long time to develop. There wasn't even a time dimension. All right? Let me give you another example. How many of you have, at one point in your life, installed something difficult tech, uh, technically, like DSL right, or ISDN? And so you go in and you go to the FAQ database and you ask for answers and you don't get the answers. You say, give me an expert. You talk to that person for 30 seconds and say, I know more than you do. Give me a better expert. All right? And hopefully you move from wherever that person is overseas to somebody in the U.S. along the way. And you escalate and you escalate. Now, before solution, in this case, most of the answers are provided down here. These answers are much more expensive than these answers. Right? And customer satisfaction isn't very good. We provide this collaborative solution where customers of a customer can provide support. And now the answers are provided in this profile and customer satisfaction is much better. Clear? Easy to get? You see the elegance of a very simple graphical approach to describing what you're doing for your customer. Now this is the value proposition for that scenario. All right, we reduce the cost of support, we improve customer response kind of things, and uh, that's the level of simplicity I'm suggesting that you want to try to achieve. One page of PowerPoint, large font, not many bullets. Hard to do, very hard to do, but very, very powerful right, for your entry into the market. Okay. The next thing you want to do is understand what different title types care about, right, as derived. So, you know, the CEO is about the stock price, and the chief sales officer is about revenue, and the finance officer is about asset protection and cash flow, right? So you need to craft messages that appeal to the title type that you're going after. And sometimes you have to start at a lower level sponsor, and maybe the messages have to change as you move from one level to the next. This is that value pane matrix I told you about, right? Where what we have, um, what did I do with that? Here is the problems we solve, forget the details, and up at the top of the titles. And then we test for the attributes I described on that previous chart, and we sell a given problem to a given executive that has all of the attributes that we're looking for. We don't try and sell everything to everybody. We're very selective about the problem we solve and what we sell. And we also can help ourselves prioritize the problems we solve so we maybe spend our engineering resources on the ones that are most important to the target market that we're going after. Okay? So this is a value messaging architecture. I suggest moving from the top down. Um, and uh, what you want to do is understand some problems you could solve in different markets. That leads you to some value premises, uh, and we iterate that. We test, right, and we iterate until we find some good ones. So the initial set might look like this, where we have a whole bunch of problems we could solve. Usually this list, when I initially talk to a company, is at least 10 to 15 long, and we need to sort it down to two or three. And several candidate markets, leading to several value premises, and what you want to do is test and select and minimize the set. Again, for clarity and simplicity in what you're doing and going to market. This is a model of integrated sales management process I've talked about. We probably aren't going to have time to get through all of this. Um, but uh, this is a sales cycle model, right? And the important thing here when you're developing a sales process model is what are we asking the customer to do? Measure where deals are and the success of your sales efforts according to customer commitment, not according to salesperson assumption about where the deal is. And this is what a real one looks like and where you have uh, explicit exit criteria from one stage to the next according to customer commitment. And, and if you needed to talk to me offline, we could talk more about that. Uh, the other thing that's really important is to recognize that no sales process is serial. There are a variety of paths. And the most important item on this chart of this complex sales process is when to stop. You should have rules about when to not continue selling for a given opportunity. And you develop those over time. We tend to focus on the order activity and salespeople hope a deal is going to close. And so we have long sell cycles. And what you need to do as you develop sales teams is to develop rule sets to prevent 
your sales teams from doing that because it results in very high selling costs. Okay, the other thing is that you need to look at funnel dynamics. This is a pipeline requirements model that says if we want this much revenue, how many touches do we need to make? How many suspects do we need to touch, right? And the answer is it's two orders of magnitude larger than you think it is. So, you know, early on, you've got some investors and advisors, and they give you four broker contacts, and in your, in your mind, that equals three orders. Doesn't happen that way, okay? Um, you asked about the rules, and I got some notes in there that you can read through on how you approach your first customer, the ingredients of the deal, um, and closing the deal. Operating as equals is really, really important. Do not assume you are an inferior organization or entity when you're dealing with these large corporations, okay? The only reason they'll deal with you is they think that you're the right resource for solving their problem. And uh, closing the sale becomes easier when you've done all the preparatory stuff. Okay, the next most important thing is get them referenceable, modify your value propositions, and publish your references on your website, in documents, all right? It, I have a client who has great referenceability and his customers will not let him publish the references and he is having trouble expanding in his market. Um, channel issues, I'm not going to spend any time covering that. There's some stuff in here about positioning, and uh, uh, you can read all that. Um, and there is a template for developing a positioning statement. I suggest you do that. Um, and that's the summary page there. Uh, so um, I think I'll end and ask, are there any further questions? Yes? Um, I want to go back to your early part where you talked about early adopters. Yeah. Uh, you mean that I'm going to sell it to somebody else? Yeah. You're, you're well, because your, your interest is served by me developing a solution that serves the broad market. Your interest is not served by my company becoming your custom engineering department. Because you'll end up with a one-off that isn't baked in the, in, in the world. Doesn't have the input of all the resources of everyone. And the other answer is, I don't, I'm not in the business of becoming your custom design department, so th no thank you down the street to somebody who doesn't have that concern, okay?